Okay. Um, so we're coming up on the end of this chapter. Can be a little overwhelming in terms of the number of equations. And no one really likes Calc 3. It's hard. But you can plug it away at the home of the problem. Come and see me if you have questions. You know, a lot of being able to do this is having, um, being able to visualize the problem properly. Um, we're going to look at yet another technique today for uh, finding the electric field. It's based on using Poisson's equation and Laplace's equation, which are differential equations. So, you know. Kind of up to this point, we've we've looked at solving, in some cases, some nasty integrals and using certain symmetries uh, to find the electric field. Or last time we looked at, you know, it was a slightly easier problem than going for the electric field uh, and finding it in terms of an integral, finding the voltage instead by actually integrating over any the volume containing the charge still not an easy task okay a little easier than finding the electric field directly from its integral which is, which is a, a vector integral this is a scalar integral, but you know the magnitude of this vector difference can be, you know, what, what this represents is you've got some charge distribution and a vector r prime to that charge distribution, and then this charge distribution creates an electric field, and then r here is that vector to that electric field. So, and then we're integrating over dv all the possible positions within that, within our within our volume. Again, not not an easy approach, but doable for certain uh, if there are certain symmetries in the problem. If the charge distribution is on a sphere or a cylinder, um, then we had if we can find the voltage. We can then find the electric field as just the, the gradient of the voltage. Okay, and the gradients that's that's differentiating. That's relatively easy. Um, Poisson's equation provides a simpler method especially if there are surrounding structures, other materials that are involved in which we have to take into account uh, various what are, what are boundary, what are known as boundary conditions. You know, for example, if I have a metal plate here and the voltage is, is fixed at, at 20 degrees on that plate relative to infinity, you know, how could I take that structure into account? How does that affect the voltage scalar field and the corresponding electric scalar field. So Poisson's equation were really there already, it's just putting a couple things together. Uh, we know that the divergence of the electric flux, the, the D field, is equal to the charge distribution, but with then the relationship between the electric flux 
field and the electric intensity E. Plugging this in and pulling the epsilon out of the derivative, we get del dot E is equal to rho B over epsilon. And then finally with making the substitution E is equal to minus del B, we have del dot del B, making that substitution for E is equal to minus rho B epsilon. So this is the divergence of the gradient. The divergence of the gradient of the, of the voltage is equal to minus rho B over epsilon. This is typically written in a shorthand notation as del squared B is equal to minus rho B over epsilon. And this is, this is Poisson's equation. It's, it's a differential equation. It's a partial differential equation. But again, if, if there are certain symmetries in you know, the way the charge is distributed or the way other objects are present in the surrounding area, this can be relatively easy to solve. Certainly a lot easier than the, these integrals that we've been having, having to deal with. Um, so where del dot del is del squared is called the Laplacian operator. And I'm going to we'll do two example problems today, you know, kind of illustrating how to how to solve for the voltage by solving. Poisson's equation or Laplace's equation. Now, in Cartesian coordinates, del squared is particularly simple. And this is an operator, it has to be applied to a scalar field, but it would be the partial with the second partial with respect to x plus the second partial with respect to y plus the second partial with respect to z. Okay. Um, now, in a charge-free region, okay. So going back up to my figure here, Poisson's equation would apply. in the region where there's charge. If we've got a charge free region outside our region of charge, Poisson's equation simplifies to that. Okay. So that, that would be uh, uh, the applicable equation And Poisson's equation just simplifies to del squared b is equal to zero. And this is called Laplace's equation. And don't, don't be scared off of this partial differential equation. In most problems that we'll deal with, we'll often, um, based on symmetries, be able to reduce this to maybe a derivative with respect to just one variable. You know, if we recognize the appropriate symmetry, uh, choose the appropriate coordinate system, and then it's just a regular differential equation that we have to solve. Um, so we'll look at one example. It's got a section devoted to this. It's the field in a capacitor. And we had an expression for the field in the capacitor earlier on making uh, making assumptions about the 
the actual voltage being um, a linear function of the distance between the plates or the electric field being constant. But now we'll come up with that same result using um, actually Laplace as a plate uh, equation. So consider two metallic circular disk of radius A separated by distance D. So um, So this is looking at them from the side. So this is my Z axis. This is my X, Y plane. I'm gonna set this up in using cylindrical coordinates though. So that would be you know, distance rho. So this distance, the radius is A and the distance between the plates is, is D. And we can assume that they're filled with some dielectric material with permittivity epsilon. I'm gonna uh, assume that the voltage difference that we've got an applied voltage between the two plates that's equal to VC, but to keep it a little more general, I'm going to, instead of assuming that the voltage on the bottom is, is zero, I'm gonna assume it's just V minus and then the voltage at the top is V minus plus VC. So we get this VC difference between them. Now there will be charge on the plates in a capacitor, but between the disk, L squared V is equal to zero and in cylindrical, coordinates. Okay, so the Laplacian is fairly simple in Cartesian coordinates. It's not as simple in other coordinate systems, but if it's on your handout, the Laplacian is there. We're almost through all of the operations on that handout, except I think some of the curl operations. But in cylindrical coordinates, this becomes one over rho, the partial der derivative with respect to rho, of rho partial of voltage with respect to rho plus one over rho squared partial squared v over partial v squared plus partial squared v over partial with respect to z which is a nasty looking equation but here's where, again, we'll take advantage of some symmetries. Now, again, this, this is the side view of this problem. The, the, the top view of you know, my x, y plane, these are circular disks. Okay. So again, we don't expect any dependence um, we don't expect the voltage to depend on the angle phi, okay, based on the symmetry. The picture looks the same, no matter what angle we're at. So that allows us to say, based on symmetry, partial V with respect to phi would be zero, and so the partial, the second partial with, with, with respect to phi would be equal to zero. The other approximation we're going to make here in order to solve this problem is we're going to assume that A is much, much greater than D. The radius of these disks is much, much greater than the distance between them. 
essentially, we're, we're going to assume that these things are have infinite radius, okay? that they, they cover the entire plane. If, if that's the case, then if they were truly infinite, you know, it wouldn't matter what radial distance we were at. Okay? We would see you know, an infinite plane above us and an infinite plane below us. Now, this is not a good assumption. You know, certainly as we get near the edges of the plate. Okay. So this is an approximation to solve the problem more exactly, then you can't make this assumption, but then we can't solve the problem analytically. So there's this trade-off. You'd have to use numerical analysis software then to actually find in the, the field. The field is on the edges, you will find actually, um, the field uh, is constant and is uh, Z directed here between the plates, but at the edges, there's actually some fringing. The field will be, remember our voltage increases as we go uh, against the field. So the field will actually, the electric field will be in the negative Z direction, but there's some fringing of the field near the edges. And so we're going to essentially ignore that. So if we do that, these first two terms disappear, and we're left with pretty simply this part, the second partial with uh, B with respect to Z. Actually, now we, we've only got Z dependence. So instead of a partial differential equation, it becomes an ordinary differential equation. <clears throat> we integrate that once with respect to z and we get dv dz would be equal to a constant what i call the constant here c1 integrate again and we find v would be c1z plus integrating c1 with respect to z we get c1z and then plus an additional constant um, we find the constants now by applying the boundary conditions. So usually work with two types of differential equations and some you may have initial conditions. That's what we often work with in circuits, for example, we're working there with differential equations with respect to time. And we know, you know maybe the voltage or current at some initial time. And boundary value problems instead, you know, we're working with uh, functions of space. And we know what the value of the function is at, you know, along some particular point, at some particular point in space or along some surface like we have here. In this particular case, we're giving the we're given the voltage at z equal to zero and at z equal to d. Uh, so the, the boundary conditions are at zero. We're saying the voltage is b minus, and at d, it's equal to b minus plus v c. So we get solving for those two constants, we get VC over D times Z plus D minus. And you can see that this satisfies the boundary conditions at Z equal to zero, V of zero is D minus. At V of D, we have D divided by D there, and we get VC plus D minus. So it's a, it's a, the voltage is a simple function of Z, the vertical distance above the lower plate. You know, everywhere along this plate, it's V minus, but you know, as we increase linearly, as we go up linearly here, we have surfaces of constant voltage 
that depend only on the height above the Z distance above the lower plate until we reach the upper plate where the voltage is V minus plus VC. Now we can get the electric field as just the gradient in this case, because we're uh, the gradient here is particularly simple since it's only got Z dependence, it's partial with respect to Z. Um, and we get BC over D. So here the electric field doesn't depend on the height. The electric field is constant. So everywhere in here, and it's minus Z directed everywhere between the plates. All electric field vectors would have the same length and intensity of VC over D. Okay. The minus sign just means it's directed in the negative C direction. So you, you'll be given a couple of homework problems like this and look for symmetries, look for an appropriate coordinate system where hopefully these partial differential equations can be reduced to you know, simple ordinary differential equations in most cases. Maybe not, we'll look at one a little bit more complicated than this later today in, in another example. But I wanna talk a little bit more about boundary conditions. What types of um, you know here we've got an, an interface between this dielectric material and uh, the metallic plate. So um, you know, what are what what are appropriate restrictions on the electric field or the electric flux? at a boundary like that. And it depends on the type of the material that, that makes up the boundary. So we're gonna first look at a case where one material or one media in which one, and here I'll say media two, is a perfect electrical conductor. And he abbreviates this in the book as PEC, and I've never seen that abbreviation in any other textbook, but it's a convenient one. So the idea here is we, we've got some interface, it might be a curved interface, but we've got two different types of material or media with some, some defining surface. Uh, between the two media, you know, it might be it might be a plate, a metal metal plate. Here I'm looking at it up from the edge, and on one side we've got a perfect electrical conductor, and we'll talk about the implications of that. We'll see a lot more. We'll talk a lot more about this perfect electrical conductor actually when we get into. The next chapter and start talking about magnetostatics and current within a conductor. And then it's also convenient to define a normal to the surface. So if it's if it's a curved surface, the direction of the normal would, would change depending on where we are on the surface. The 
the surface S of the perfect electrical conductor is an equa equipotential surface. Which now why the surface S of the perfect electrical conductor is an equipotential surface. Well, if there's a voltage difference between any two points on the surface, there'll be a corresponding current flowing between those two points from, from Ohm's law. But right now we're considering only the electrostatic case where charges is not charges and moving. So we don't have, you know, this isn't a wire. It's just a conductor in space with no current moving through the conductor. So there could be stationary charge along the surface. But because right now we're working in electrostatics, we'll have to modify these boundary conditions later on. But if it's an equipotential surface, there can't be equipotential means it has a constant voltage everywhere on the surface. So, um, which implies that the component of del V along the surface must be zero or using our unit vector, the component of del V that is at 90 degrees to the normal vector has to be equal to, to zero. So that's the mathematical equation, representation of that statement that there can be a component of del V um, uh, along the surface. Actually, there can be a, a gradient anywhere within the, uh, the conductor or we would have current flow. There can be a change in voltage as we go across the interface though. But there's no change in voltage anywhere along the interface. And that's what, that's what this is saying based on our assumptions that we're working with electrostatics or Equivalently, the component of the E field that lies in the surface has to be zero. And for a, a, a surface, uh, we can always break a vector down into two components, one vector that lies in the surface and then another component of the vector that, that's perpendicular to it. So this is for a, a perfect electrical conductor. Or another way you'll see this stated is that the tangential component of the electric field has to be equal to zero. So what, what this means is, you know, at this interface between a material and a perfect electrical conductor, you know, the E field is, is pointing either directly out or directly in, directly in. It can't be, it can't have any sort of angle because that would imply that there's a component of the electric field that lies along the surface. So again, it has, the electric field has to be directed normally to the surface of a perfect electrical conductor. Now, more, Generally, between any two media. So here I'm dropping the restriction that, that one is a perfect electrical conductor. Still have two different media with an interface between them. then KVL can be used to show 
at the tangential components of the E field have to be the same. So right here at the surface, E10 1 and, and E10 2 have to be have to have the same direction, have to have the same magnitude. Now, I, I didn't prove that. He goes through a proof in the textbook of this, but um, you know, th this is the result of that proof. And it's essentially doing a little KVL loop here, right, right at the, right at, uh, around the, the interface. Now, the way we can represent this as a vector equation is that E1 cross N is equal to E2 cross N. It's another way of just saying that tangential components are equal, but stating it more generally in terms of the entire electric field vector, as E1 cross N would be the component of E1 that, that lies within the surface of the tangential component. It's often written in electromagnetics books like this. Uh, if you if take, if you subtract E2 cross N from both sides and factor out the, the N cross, then you get this result. And that's again, same, same, same thing. We'll see that although we're restricting ourselves to electrostatics right now, we'll see later on that this, this boundary condition applies even for time varying fields. We can also get another boundary condition on E um, regarding the normal component. So we've got a we've got a condition here on the tangential components that they have to be equal or uh, for any two media, or if one of the one of the media is a perfect conductor, the tangential component has to be zero on both sides. From Gauss's law. said that this closed integral over a surface is equal to the charge enclosed. Now here I'm going to tilt my two media a little bit so I can draw a better picture. I'm going to assume that now at this interface we've got some surface charge. Rho S that might be present, like on a plate of a capacitor. And the surface now is just a, a small cylinder, it's an infinitesimally small cylinder. And so previously I was calling the, the interface my surface. Um, now I've got yet another surface that I need to talk about. I mean, I've got an S now refers to this small cylinder, that, this virtual cylinder that I'm going to place at the interface. Sometimes this is called a, a Gaussian surface or a Gaussian pillbox. Um, and Gauss's law tells me that the integral over this little, you know, it's a surface integral, so top, bottom, and sides, that the, you know, the net flux out of this little pillbox is equal to the charge enclosed by on the surface. So is this clear what's going on here? So, you know, at the, at the surface, this little cylinder, I've got two bottle caps or something, that I'm putting on the top and bottom of you know, a metal plate. And then those two bottle caps are forming my surface. My surface actually, my cylinder actually extends through the plate though. 
uh, can be used to show that, and this is this is in the book, but I'm skipping the details. That the difference between the electric flux vectors, the difference between the normal component of the electric flux vectors is equal to the surface charge density. Uh, again, if there is no surface charge, these normal components are going to be equal. Okay, so this is similar to kind of this equation, except here we've got a cross product. So that would that's referring to the tangential components. Notice this is a dot product. So this is the component of D1 or D2 that's normal to the interface. And so this is saying the difference in the normal components is equal to the surface charge density on, on the interface. Or in terms of the electric field, N dot, Epsilon one E one minus Epsilon two E two is equal to rho S. Of course, this would be in um, uh, coulombs per meter squared. It's a charge density. Remember, that's actually the units of our electric flux vector as well, coulombs per meter squared. So th this is one of the reasons that the, the D vector was introduced. That if you work with the D vectors at interfaces, you don't have to worry about the, the differences in permittivity between the two material, epsilon one and epsilon two. So it's actually a little easier when you're working with boundary value problems to find the D field at each interface the normal component of the D field um, is continuous across the interface. Now, if two is a perfect electrical conductor, then D2 is equal to zero and D1 is equal to rho s. Is equal to the surface charge density. Okay, I wanted to work through, we've got uh, time here to work through another problem. And I'm gonna have you guys work through most of the math here as I lead you through it. And this is another application of solving Laplace's equation. I right, assign this homework. Okay, we're gonna work this one. The one I did not assign this homework. Um, so, and now our, our approach is always try to start with, regardless of your artistic ability, always try to start with the picture. Um, consider a perfectly conducting sphere of radius two meters centered at the origin and surrounded by free space. Okay, so, so this one's particularly simple. So, yeah, it's, it's a sphere. So do your best to draw some sort of circular object there. And put down on the figure, everything that you know about the problem. We're given that the voltage on the surface of the sphere is equal to 20 volts. And then 
you know, this is equal to two meters everywhere. This is X, Y, Z. You know, it's got a radius of two meters. And I say, if the potential on the surface is 20 volts, what is the electric potential field for VR greater than uh, uh, two meters? Okay. Solve this problem using Laplace's equation. So Laplace, so, and I guess the other thing here, and I'll indicate this is free space by just saying that, putting an epsilon zero out there. So Laplace's equation, is del squared V is equal to zero. Now, what do you think is the appropriate coordinate system to use here? Cartesian, why? Just because you like Cartesian. It, it, it says here we're working with a sphere. Okay. So that should say spherical. Okay. And, and the reason is, you know, our boundary condition can be quite easily in spherical coordinates. We, we have V of two is equal to 20. Okay. So Actually, the next step, now pull out your handout and write down. Yeah, I know we always want to use Cartesian coordinates because we've been using Cartesian coordinates that probably introduced to, you know, X, Y grid, probably, I don't know, in third or fourth or fifth grade. And, you know, you use that all through high school, maybe not until calculus before you run into somewhere in high school, you probably see, you know, polar coordinates in two dimensions. And it's not until it's calculus that you, you run into maybe cylindrical and spherical. But generally, you know, if it's a sphere, spherical. If it's a if it's a tin can, a cylinder, cylindrical. If it's any sort of box type, cube type thing or a wall, you know, then you can use Cartesian, you know, something that's where the surface can be easily described. So pull out your handout for and write down the, the uh, expression for the Cartesian for the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. So find it, it should be one over R squared partial with respect to R, R squared partial B with respect to R plus one over R squared sine theta partial with respect to theta sine theta partial B with respect to theta plus one over R squared sine squared theta partial squared v with respect to v is equal to zero. It takes 15 minutes to write it down. You know, what hope do we have of actually solving it? Here's where you have to take into, a, into account the symmetry of the problem. Can we drop any terms here? based on symmetry. So what I usually ask myself is, you know, I've got this two meter sphere 
setting at this point, and then you know I'm at some other point in space and looking back toward the sphere. Does what I see vary depending on the angle phi? Does the picture change here? I've got 20 volts everywhere on that sphere. Now, if that voltage were a function of phi, if it somehow varied on that surface as a function of phi, I would see different voltages as I moved around. But no matter what angle I'm at here, no matter what the angles I go around this thing, I see exactly the same picture. So by that argument, we can, we can say there can't be any variation in the voltage with respect to the angle B. We can make a similar argument with respect to the angle theta. Remember, that's the angle we make with the Z axis. You know, now I'm going around that thing, you know, you know, looking down on it. But you know, if I'm floating out in free space out in the, you know, out in deep space somewhere, and there's a sphere and no other reference around me, do I really know I'm above it or below it? I see exactly, it's just me and the sphere. They, we're the only things in the universe. I see exactly the same picture, no matter what. You know, this elevation angle is, you know, I'm looking back toward the sphere, I, I'm moving all over. Now, what about variation in R? As I move away from the object, do I notice any change? It's smaller, right? So I, I can't say that there isn't variation in V with respect to R. Because things are changing as I change with as I as I get farther away in distance, but my my sphere gets smaller. But at least at this point, I've reduced this. I've, I've made this argument that the voltage can only depend on R. Now this looks particularly nasty, perhaps as well, but it's, it's an ordinary differential equation. I dropped an R squared here tonight. The first thing I can do is actually multiply both sides by R squared. VBR, R squared, VB, VR is equal to zero. Now this is some function. So I can integrate to say R squared, VB, VR is equal to C1 is the first concept. I'm trying to get the V. Okay, so, so one integral gets me R squared dV dr. So now I can solve for dV dr as C1 over R squared. One more integration gets me V as a function of the radial distance would be that's minus c1 over r right it's so the derivative of that yeah uh, plus c2 would be my now okay so now I have to apply the boundary conditions. The one here at a uh, radius of two meters where it says it's 20 volts. Well, he, he doesn't explicitly state what my zero volt reference is. So if that's the case, you can assume that the reference is at infinity, the ground points at infinity. So although that's not explicitly stated, V infinity being zero implies that C2 is zero. And then the other condition I have is that V2 is equal to 20. So that's minus C1 over 2, or C1 is equal to minus 40. And so finally, I get the voltage as a function of position is minus 40 over R, okay, where R is just the radial distance of the vector. It only depends on.
it only depends on the, my distance away from the origin. And I can find the electric field vector now. The electric field vector is just the negative of the gradient of this. So you can use this approach and you have to make these symmetry arguments to, to simplify these differential equations. But you can make the, you can make these arguments and problems that involve certainly spheres, cylinders, walls, cubes, things like that by choosing an appropriate coordinate system. We still have, I think, primarily one more topic in this chapter, and that's that's actually taking a look at capacitors. So I think we start that on Friday, and we'll wrap that up on Monday.